Hey, this is Floss Weekly, and I'm Jonathan Bennett. Today, Catherine Druckmann joins me as we talk to Kevin Lynn about Dendron, a new note-taking app built on VS Code. You're not going to want to miss it, so stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 619, recorded Wednesday, March 3rd, 2021. Note-taking with Dendron. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Linode. Simplify your cloud infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half. Get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit. Text TWIT to 474747 or visit linode.com slash floss and click on the Create Free Account button to get started. Hello, welcome to Floss Weekly. I have a great show for you today about a really neat project, uh, Dendrite, uh, which may tickle your neurons because that is among other meanings, refers to neurons. Um, We will get to that in just a minute, though. First, though, I I need to bring my lovely and talented co-host, Miss Catherine, to the show. Hey. Welcome. Hey, Catherine, I don't think we've ever appeared together. This is my first time ever getting to talk to you and meet you. Um, No. Yeah, it's it's great to finally... This is only my second time. (laughs) Oh, okay, okay. Well, that, that makes sense. It's always fun... Um, not that we enjoy having the main hosts out, but it's always fun when we get to do these shows without it, without Doc because us co-hosts get to meet each other and, and kind of collaborate, and that, that is always fun. That is fun. It's like the parents are away, are away and, and we get to <laughs> we, make a we big children mess. Get to, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to try not to make a big mess today. Uh, Miss Catherine, where, where, are you, yes, where are you talking to us from? I am in Houston, Texas. Oh well, you're just you're just yeah. south of me. You are just that way a few hours. Right. Ah, yeah. Uh, in Texas, in Houston, did you uh, did you come through that big storm a couple of weeks ago? Okay. Oh uh, yeah, we're we're fine. Landscaping, not so much. It was very very cold. <laughs> it's a very strange experience all around. I'll tell you all yes. about power grids now. <laughs> yes, yes. I think most of us can. Well, landscaping can be fixed. Um, yeah. Oh, we have a we have a bunch to get into. Um, we have some stories to talk about, but before we get into any of that, I have an important announcement to make, and that is that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Linode. Managing your complex cloud infrastructure shouldn't be hard. Linode believes in cloud computing for all. Simplify your cloud infrastructure with Linode's Linux virtual machines and develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and easier. Why Linode? Uh, you get an intuitive cloud manager and a full-featured API. Uh, Linode has data centers around the world with simple and consistent pricing regardless of location. You choose the data center nearest to you or to your workload. And they have award-winning customer support 24-7, 365. There's no tiers or handoffs regardless of your plan size. Think of what you can do. You can build a website. You can build an application. You can even back up your computers. It's up to you. You can easily launch and enrich your developer applications, your hosted services, your website. You can do artificial intelligence and machine learning. You can build gaming service. You can do uh, CI, CD environments. You can launch and scale in the cloud with their virtual machines. You can choose shared and dedicated compute instances, or you can use your $100 in credit on S3-compatible object storage, manage Kubernetes, and more. Be sure to check out Linode's new YouTube channel for video tutorials, security tips, and more at youtube.com slash Linode. Bryce Adams from Metaric says, From the start, we were looking for a partner, not a provider. Some of the large providers see us only as a transaction. Linode is a kind of partner that will be with us from the start, today, and beyond. We also want to congratulate Linode for their multiple Stevie Award wins. Their sales and customer service were awarded for excellence for the third consecutive year. Simplify your infrastructure and cut your cloud bills in half with Linode's Linux virtual machines. Whether you're developing a personal project or managing larger workloads, you deserve simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions. Get started on Linode today with $100 in free credit for listeners of Floss Weekly. You can find all the details at linode.com floss. 
not at your desktop, simply text TWIT to 474747 to get your free credit. Linode.com slash floss and click on the create free accounts button to get started. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. And we thank Linode for their sponsorship of Floss Weekly. And Catherine, I believe you have an open source story that you wanted to talk about. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and move to that. Well, I do. So, you know, I ran across an article in Forbes the other day um, reiterating the, the issues that Elastic has been having with Amazon. Um, they, they have made an effort to, uh, let's say, reduce the bleed monetarily. Uh, they <laughs> don't want Amazon to be able to just use their product, slap their own you know, house, in-house label on it, and resell it. So, they, so in January... They changed their licensing. But the interesting thing was that that was not what was newsworthy. What was newsworthy is the perception that that has perhaps triggered a, a chain of events or, or tipped the initial domino. And other companies and, and projects are, are, are changing their own behavior as a result. And that's what I thought was particularly interesting. Um, and they, they uh. cite another project called Light Meter, that announced a, a very bold announcement involving trademarking and then linked to a lot of the elastic announcements. And what, what I thought was interesting about that was that trademarking isn't particularly new in open source. I mean, there are lots of mm -hmm. trademarks in the open source space. Drupal's a trademark, for example. I work with Drupal. Um, but yeah, the perception is, 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 is key here, I think, right? So if, if there is a perception that... that Elastic is having this effect. I thought that's interesting, um, but but at the same time, I mean, is is anybody really at fault here? I'm not sure. Amazon <laughs> is at fault, you know. So, but the, it's certainly being painted that way. I don't know, and I think it just has some larger implications for for open source and the people who participate in it. And I think that's definitely yeah. worth discussing. I don't know if you have any ideas about that. Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. I, I know we've seen this um, kind of this dance go back and forth for years now where you'll have an open source project and then Amazon will say, oh, we, we like this project. We're going to offer it as a service. And then the devs of the open source project that had their own little offering, you know, all of their customers go and leave and go to Amazon and they're kind of left holding the bag and, and their revenue stream goes away. And so there's been, you know, different projects that's tried to fix this over the years. We've seen some uh, royally bad ideas where people do things like uh, licensing. Um, they change their open source license to include uh, the Commons Clause was one of the big ones back about a year ago, I think. And uh, that that was interesting to watch. I I haven't seen I haven't seen trademarking be used. Uh, directly in the Amazon case, uh, but I do know that there are some open source projects that, when they get packaged into a um, a Linux distribution, one of the things that has to happen is all of those trademarked images has to be the trademark names and the image and all of those things have to be stripped out of it. Um, one of the really really noteworthy examples is Red Hat. Uh, the the CentOS rebuild of Red Hat, one of the big tasks that they had to do, and now with all the things with CentOS happening recently, people are having to do once again, is go and dig out all of the all of the references to Red Hat because that's a trademark name. So it's it's not something new, but maybe people are are thinking about it in a new way. I'm not sure. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's also interesting because, it, the, ironically, the last time I was on, we had a similar conversation, which was about restricting existing open source licensing. And in that, in that case, it was ethical licensing, ethical source and that movement. And this is, mm -hmm. this is a commercial interest. And, but there's definitely a lot going on in that, in that arena as far as licensing and restricting use, which is such a huge departure from the origins of open source. So, you know, I wonder if, if are we dinosaurs? I don't know. <laughs> I I don't know. I, I I feel some I feel some days like a dinosaur. Uh I, I think I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, the original open source licenses, they're not they're not our scriptures, right? They're not a holy text. Uh which is why not, you no. see things like the GPL V three was developed. Um but at the same time it's not like these questions were not considered at the time. You know, you go back and you read the the guys that originally wrote the the definition of open source, 
and they talked about things like this. Like they were very aware that, well, eventually commercialization is going to be an issue. Um, this idea of ethics is an issue. And they thought long and hard about that. And they came up with the answers that, you know, have kind of been codified into the open source definitions. And so far they've worked. So I, uh, I would caution everyone to be very, very careful about moving away from from what has worked and made open source great in the last 20, 30 years. I think that that's a really great point and great advice. Um, I do have a story that's actually very, very, well, in some ways it's similar. Uh, it, it definitely ties into some of the same threads. Uh, and that is... Um, on its FOSS, um, someone wrote an, uh, an opinion article about Google Chrome and Chromium and the fact that, uh, well, we've moved into this world where there are basically two browsers. There's Firefox and there's everything based on Chromium. And Google Chrome, according to this author, um, John Paul Worthschild, um, Google Chrome is beginning to sweat bullets because they are losing Chrome share to Chromium browsers. So you've got Chromium itself, you've got Brave, um, Microsoft Edge is now based on Chromium. And they've had this, this strategy for, for years now where they, they take the Chromium open, Google takes the Chromium open source software that, that they really do most of the work on. And then they have their proprietary features that they build into it and distribute as, you know, the Chrome binaries. Well, apparently there were some of those features that the, the hooks and the APIs were left in Chromium to the point to where uh, Chromium on Linux and uh, some of these other platforms were able to use them. Things like a click to call um, and some of the syncing features that were, according to Google, only ever supposed to work on Chrome. And Google discovered this and went in and made the necessary changes to to block those features from Chromium. And it kind of had a chain reaction where apparently some of the people packaging Chromium for the various Linux distributions uh, specifically kind of stopped and said, well, is this even worth it anymore? If Chrome, if Google is going to start removing features out of Chromium, where does it where does it stop? And I just I thought that was interesting to look at and to kind of think about this. For for one thing, I don't know that it's a. I use Chrome and I I love the features that are in Chrome, but one could observe that it's maybe not a good thing that we are approaching the world again where there's only one major browser. Um, but it's also interesting because you do you once again you have this. Uh, it's not a conflict of interest, but it's. Um, not necessarily aligning interests between yeah. Google Chrome, the business, and Google Chromium, the open source project. And I think it's interesting to see, you know, as they try to work these issues out and to watch where it's going to go. Yeah, it is interesting. And it, it's also interesting, like, so people who are going to listen to this later won't see, you know, what was on, just on the screen. And it's this very bold uh, heading, Google only supports open source when it benefits them. <laughs> and it's, um, I don't know, I think that's, I think that's the root of the controversy, for sure. Yep. Yeah. But at the same time, you have these people that are putting their resources into the open source project, and they are a business, yeah. and they've got to make money. And so it's it's just, it's difficult, you know? we It's one of the things that we ask just about every project. It's one of the things that we'll ask today, the project that we'll talk to. How do you guys make money with open yeah. source? Because it's something that, in some ways, we still haven't figured out all the way. I agree. Yeah, I mean, and, and I have I, I come from a company that puts a lot of money into an open source project. I work for a company called Acquia that that funds a lot of Drupal um, contribution, mm -hmm. and and I've yet to see an open source project that isn't um, that isn't heavily weighted, uh, you know, in terms of contribution from one company. So I don't know. We'll see how that goes. All right. Well. I enjoy getting to chat uh, with Catherine about those couple of open source stories. That's really neat. But that is not the main reason why we're here today. We are here to talk with Kevin Lynn about uh, Dendron. I believe I said Dendrite earlier. Dendron, uh, which is a, to, to put it very, very simply, is a note-taking app. But that's probably insultingly oversimplified. Um, but we have the man himself. Uh, Kevin, can you tell us more about Dendron? Give us the 30,000 foot view. What uh, what problem is it trying to solve? Yeah, happy to do that. And thanks for having me here, Jonathan. 
So, uh, Dendron, it's uh, Dendron, the way that I like to describe it, and this is evolving over time, it's a scalable note-taking tool that helps you reference anything in seconds. So we're built on top of Git uh, and VS Code and Markdown. And what Dendron um, is meant to be is it's one single source of truth for all the information that you care about. And we help make it frictionless to add, organize, and selectively share the notes and information that you have. Um, right now, Dendron, Dendron runs as a VS Code extension. So um, being a VS Code extension, it runs in all VS Code compatible editors. So that's VS Codium, VS Code. I think people have made it work in Thea. And um, you edit. So we keep all notes in plain text markdown. Um, we add some additions to markdown so you can have um, additional features like embeddings, mermaid diagrams, math, and LaTeX. And um, so the format is just plain text, so it's easily interoperable. And then we also have something we call pods, which help you import and export from Dendron and to Dendron. But. So is, is Dendron, boy, there's a bunch of different directions I want to go at once. Uh, is Dendron kind of like writing your own Wikipedia for your own knowledge? Essentially, that's one way of thinking about it, where you can think of Wikipedia as one source of truth for the world, um, being w written in MediaWiki uh, back in the day. Um, you can think of Dendron as creating your own personal wiki for specifically the data that you care about, but also like in the way that you care about it. For example, like in Wikipedia, there is one source of truth for um, I think a famous example is like the color of that dress where like some people think it's blue, some people think it's green, but really it's like, it becomes a matter of opinion. The thing with Dendron is that it's um, creating a Wikipedia for yourself that you can also share and fork off others. It's actually a lot of, um, think of like a Wikipedia slash GitHub analogy where not only are you creating your own Wikipedia, but it's also something that you can share with the world and other people can build off um, and extend. Okay. And so what, um, what kinds of data go into Dendron? Is it, is it strictly limited to text or if, you know, if someone had wanted to include video files, images, uh, things of that nature, binaries even, uh, inside a, a Dendron tree, um, is that something that's possible? Yeah, so I mean, what Dentron is right now is we give you a set of tools essentially to work with Markdown in a hierarchical manner so that you can um, organize your notes into these hierarchies. But really, like you can think of it just as a GitHub, or a, sorry, not a GitHub, but a Git repository. And so anything you can throw in a Git repository, you can throw into Dentron. Um, you can, so today, if you wanted to add images, wanted to add binaries, wanted to add anything, you could add it um, into, so the or mental model is a vault. So in Dendron, you have a workspace, and a workspace can consist of multiple vaults. Each vault is a unique Git repository, and Dendron does the work of stitching together all the contents from all your vaults and presenting one unified interface on top of that. Um, so right now, if you have a link to, for example, a binary, like a video or something else, um, Dendron lets you open up the link, but it'll use whatever your system uses for that particular format. If it's a PDF, it'll open it up in Preview and Mac. If it's a movie, it might be VLC um, on Linux. Um, so um, we support files in the sense that if your operating system supports that, then Dendron can open it for you. It It's... It's very similar then to uh, what Tim Berners-Lee originally intended the, the internet to be, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I, I've had people make that comparison before. Um, when I created Dendron, it was because I needed a note-taking tool for myself. Um, and I think once, but like you talked about note-taking in the beginning and um, describing this as note-taking. And in some sense, like I have a hard time um, like note taking seems like a very limited word in terms of like what we're trying to do. But if you think about note taking in the sense of like just a way of externalizing information so that you can make use of it again, like in a way like that's if you like scope out um, 30,000 feet, that's kind of like what the Internet is or like what all these digital platforms 
help us do is to help us externalize information so that we can make use of it either immediately or at a later point in time. There was, there was a buzzword back a, a decade ago, uh, mind mapping. Would it, be, would it be applicable to describe Dendron as a mind map application? There's definitely a lot of overlap. Uh, we have a lot of users that like to use Dendron for mind mapping. Um, I think where Dendron, uh, where Dendron focuses on uh, is that, yes, you can mind map in Dendron. We show you, so we have backlinks between all your notes. So if you make a link between one note and another, then um, that is tracked in Dendron and you get, um, and so you get to track your notes as if it was in a mind map. Um, the thing where we focus on though is, uh, is first establishing a hierarchy for your notes so that um, when you need to reference a note, you can do so by its hierarchy. And what this means is um, like, for example, like. We, uh, one of our users, he's a professional um, Street Fighter. And so what he does is um, he has, like in Street Fighter, every character basically has like the same moveset, but slight variations um, like uh, on their special moves or whatever. Or you can think of like programming languages where like every programming language, you have like similar concepts, just different implementation details. What you can do in Dungeon then is you can, for example, create one hierarchy for it. This is my programming language hierarchy. And all programming languages have different data structures, different have control flows, different ways of interacting with I.O. And you construct that one hierarchy, which you can now use to, for example, organize all your programming nodes, where you can use like one character move, one way of describing character moves to like map to all your different Street Fighter characters that you want to track. So I actually downloaded and tried it out last night. I'm already an occasional VS Code user, so I went ahead and just you know added it on. It was pretty easy. Um, what struck me, and also what struck me looking at the documentation, is that it's incredibly flexible, almost intimidatingly so. It's you know there, it, the users and use cases seem to be pretty widely varied, and I wondered you know if that in itself creates a bit of a learning curve, um, and I, I wondered if you could speak to you know how what the easiest way to get started or kind of get past that learning curve is. Yeah, um, so that's definitely feedback we've gotten in the past. It's just, the, if you look on the website, it's there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, so getting started is tough. So one of the things we did is we revamped our getting started uh, guide. So now there's actually a tutorial to walk you through um, basically creating a note, creating links from that note, and then also publishing your note. Um, those are some of the most common operations you do in Dungeon, and so that's really you know, the onboarding ramp, um, just getting started and using it as if you would basically a notepad. Just create a note, put stuff in it, and then only branch into the other features as you need to. Okay, so how do you feel about this as a, as a tool for generating documentation? Is that its primary use case, or is that just a, a secondary sort of benefit that it might be suitable for that? Yeah, so documentation is something that you, it is one use case for Dendron. Um, I wouldn't say it's a primary use case, though we do have people doing that. Um, some features that we have that make it good for that is we, so you can take the notes that you have and you can compile it into a static site. Or what we do is Dendron has a CLI that will, you give it, um, then we have a specific configuration that tells you as what files you want to publish, and we will generate static assets based off that. So the Dendron website that you see right now, that is made from notes and Dendron. Um, and what's nice about that is it's completely portable. Once you have those assets, you can host them anywhere you want, um, whether it be S3, Netlify, or uh, you know your own custom server. Um, and so documentation-wise, um, if it's a pretty good use case, and it's actually something we do ourselves for Dendron and the related projects that uh, are in it. 
Hey, uh, I'll jump back in real quick. Uh, you you made the decision to build this on VS Code, which is interesting. I'm I'm curious. Have you gotten have you gotten any pushback from the community or the you know the open source community at, at large for making the decision to build this on top of a Microsoft project? Yeah, yeah, it's Microsoft is funny because <laughs> I mean now that Microsoft is GitHub, most open source is actually a Microsoft um, affiliated project one way or another. Um, but as far as VS Code is concerned, so the reason I started on VS Code was, um, I guess, to backtrack a little into the history. Um, I have over 20,000 notes um, in Markdown that I've kept around with me for like the last decade. And so the reason why I built Dendron was because I couldn't find a note-taking tool that could manage that. And so what I ended up setting on was I had Vim and a bunch of scripts that would help me organize my nodes into these hierarchies in which I could then reference. And then um, essentially what had happened is this system of managing my nodes in this hierarchical fashion um, actually worked for me. Like with over 20,000 nodes uh, using this hierarchical approach, I could reference anything in my knowledge base in a few seconds. And something I wanted to prove out um, when I launched Engine was, now, does this scheme work for anybody that is not Kevin? Is this just like, does it work because of me or does it work because the system works? <laughs> and so this is why I launched on VS Code was because if you look at building an editor, especially a note-taking tool, there's a lot of generic work that goes into it. Um, setting up the windowing system, the font system, um, having a way of deploying code that runs you know, on multiple operating systems. And so all of this was not intrinsic to my basic thesis, which is, does this hierarchical approach of note-taking work for anyone else besides Kevin? And so I chose VS Code in the beginning because it was the fastest way for me to test this out. And also the second reason being, um, I'm a heavy Vim user, and like my browser has Vim key bindings, so I can't um, honest, like I can't use a tool that doesn't support Vim key bindings, but at the same time, I wanted Engine to be accessible for people um, and even like non-coders. And so, like I couldn't, you know, focus all the time building Vim key bindings into the product. And so, VS Code was already what I was using naturally. It was fast to prototype. It had stuff like Vim key bindings, which I didn't have time to work on and couldn't justify. Um, and so, for all those reasons, um, that's why. Um, Dendron was launched on VS Code. Now, that being said, um, I think most of our usage, so Dendron, we don't have any sort of telemetry, so I can't tell you exactly how people are using Dendron, but we do have download counts. And I can tell you that um, Dendron is downloaded now more on VS Codium, um, which is the open source version of uh, the, like the open non-Microsoft version of VS Code um, than on VS Code itself. Interesting. So, to to take a little tangent there, uh, have you have you answered the question? Is uh, is Dendron useful for people that are not Kevin? Yes. So um, to answer the question, yes, um, that was one of the best feelings or like the best milestones in the project is that Dendron launched um, in June of last year. So I posted um, Dendron in a couple of Reddit forums and on Hacker News. And I, I would say within the first week, we had users. Um, we have a Discord community. Um, now it's over 500 people. And initially, there was definitely a lot of skepticism, especially um, for people that are familiar with note-taking. Like right now, what's really big in note-taking is like Loam, bidirectional links, and this whole idea of like, you don't need to organize your nodes, just follow the links and everything will happen <laughs> automatically. And so definitely initially, we had a lot of people that are like, what are you doing? This is backwards, like I'm never gonna do this. But they, um, what was really hard find, gratifying is some of those users, initially some of our biggest skeptics, came back, gave Dendron a shot, used it, and now they're some of our biggest supporters. In this, and they've been talking about how like this is the one system where they actually feel like you know, they have control over where their stuff is and they don't feel like things are getting lost and they have like a sense of calm. So long, uh, I guess, side story, like yes, it has validated that. Uh, I'm I'm humored by the way that uh, that went together. It sounds like uh, so there, there's a there's a programming myth that if you write your code well enough, it will uh, self document. Uh, it sounds like there might be a note taking myth that if you write your notes well enough, they will self organize. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely the belief. I think that's, um, if you look at a lot of note-taking tools now, like the thing I think that people are trying to hinge their hopes on is this idea of like artificial intelligence or like having some sort of super smart search that will make sure that you can, you don't need to um, organize. But like the problem is like, take Google. Like who, like who has ever like put something in a Google Doc or a Google Drive and failed to find it again? I bet you that answer is basically anyone that has ever used it. And that's because like search doesn't work for personal notes. Like maybe it will someday, but we're not there yet. And it's a really hard problem to solve just because you have such limited data. And um, while it can be effective, it's kind of like Siri, where she is like, you know, she might be 90% accurate, but the last 10% drives you crazy. Um, and another comparison I have is weight loss. Um, no matter like what all these different weight loss programs try to tell you, like at the end of the day, like it takes work to uh, lose weight. And so that's where Dendron comes in is we are not saying that, you know, with Dendron, you never need to, uh, like you don't need to put any work into it, but think of it more like Excel. Like we give you a structure in which you can organize your notes so you can manage it at scale. Uh, whereas before, maybe you just had pen and paper, and therefore you weren't able to do that. Uh, Doc Searles, um, who is actually off getting his second COVID shot, he he gave us permission to, be able to tell everybody he's going to be he's going to be vaccinated. Um, he in the back chat, he, he logged in and is listening. Um, made the made a statement that he would love to see something that records a map. Uh, that remembers you linking from page to page or site to site rather than just a flat history like one gets in a browser history page. And I'm curious, does Dendron, <clears throat> does Dendron have this ability to kind of uh, track as you move through your notes so that, you know, a month down the road you could say, I remember finding this somewhere in my Dendron tree but I can't remember exactly which page it was on. Let me go, you know, check my history. Is is that is that a thing that's built into this? Yeah, uh, that's not a thing yet, but I think that's a great feature suggestion. So Dendron today, uh, what we do track is we track links between your pages. So if you link between a page, like you can explore that graph, but we don't track your behavior, for example, as you browse your notes. It's something that we do wanna add because one of the most effective cues for human memory is time. And so like, if you can go back to a day and replay that day, that would um, that would, would work very well. And we have all the data. It's just that um, right now, if you look at our GitHub, we have over 180 issues. So, so all user requests for features and additions. And right now, <laughs> uh, being a solo developer that is working full time on this, um, I've learned that I have to prioritize. So it sounds like that is definitely something that I want to add down the line. Um, so not yet, but yes. Kevin, you are you are a full time solo developer on an open source project that kind of makes you a unicorn, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's yeah, there's not a lot of us, and I mean it's it's. <laughs> It definitely takes some work, and it definitely takes some adjusting and doing some boundaries and having some systems. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I think everybody who's listening to this and is part of this like knows like maintaining an open source project is there's a lot of work involved. I mean, it's incredibly rewarding um, when like as things line up, and definitely I would say that one of the things that has made it possible for me to keep working on this is because um, being an open source project, um, having feedback from users from the first week, um, like that was definitely one of the things that actually helped me in this case, like keep going is the fact that I did have users that were giving me feedback and support and, um, you know, using Dendron. Um, so yes, it's hard, but it's also worth it. So, so are, are you it, actively looking for contributors or uh, you say you're a solo developer and I just I was going to ask you actually if there is a a uh, community of contributors but is that something you're looking for? Yeah, oh and sorry I don't mean to undermine contributors. Um I mean so I'm a the only person that's working on this full time. But Dendron also has right. contributors that are uh that have that submit pull requests and add uh, add to the code base. And so that's actually something I'm pretty happy about in the sense that I would say like probably for our first three, four months, it's mostly been me. Uh, and then 
And then within the last couple of months, we've definitely had an uptick of community members who have added both minor and actually more significant features to the code base. And so that's also something that's been making things easier is that now I find myself spending a um, portion of time just you know merging pull requests and reviewing issues, um, which is really nice. And that is great. Yeah, scaling a, a community is a skill in itself, I think. Yeah, in the, in the beginning, what one of the things that I did is so we, I got my community on Discord, and you can give people roles or badges. And so um, I created a community page, community page with like badges for people that make like contributions to Dungeon. And um, so we have, for example, like if you fix Kevin's typos in the docs or anywhere, then you're a taxonomist. Um, if you contribute to the code in some way, then you're a horticulturalist. If you publish your site using a Dungeon, you're like a planter. And so those were like just like easy ways of recognizing people in the community to the community and also just like getting people involved. Mm, that's great. Hey, we had a, a, an interesting question from the from the chat room. We have a, a live IRC chat and a handful of people that hang out with us every every week. And it's really neat. Um, and uh, Reverb Mike asks, uh, is this better than Evernote? And he says, Evernote will search all the words in my notes, and I can find things I forgot that way. And uh, I, I think he's kind of he's asking about this idea of doing search on personal notes is hard. And uh, maybe if I can if I can add a question to that, why is that hard? Yeah. Um, so glad you brought that up. So the Evernote example of um, searching, and you know, you can search through every single note in Evernote and machines are fast enough. Like if you look at the Google search result, it's like we have a billion results and we came up and we came up with it in like a hundred milliseconds. The problem is you as a human still need to scan through and find everything. And so in like if you think about it in like database terms, it's basically whenever you do a search on personal notes, it's like doing a full table scan of your entire database. Mm -hmm. And that might be tractable in the beginning, but as you accumulate notes, like past a couple hundred or past a couple thousand, like that eventually becomes untenable, unless of course you have a good structure in place. For example, you, you've you organized it in such a way that you have, or you have some sort of naming convention, or you're just looking for something that's not very common. Um, and so, um, and you know, it'll work in some cases, but it won't work, for example, if you're looking for um, like I used to do a lot of R programming. Good luck trying to find R um, in like notes, <laughs> and 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 this goes to like why search is hard for personal notes is like we're all so used to Google and like oh search works. I search for anything on the web and I get a result. But that's because Google is you know arguably the biggest one of the biggest tech companies in the world and has the corpus this entire internet and you know they get the best out of trillions and trillions of results. That's very different for personal notes, where you have a very small sample size, that is, where search is not really trained over, and you're just doing simple keywords without the benefit of you know, the aggregate search results of the human race. And in that respect, it's a very different problem. And this is why, like, if search was possible over personal notes, then you should be able to find stuff in Google Drive. And I would argue that for most people, like that's not the case. Like Google Drive is where stuff goes to die. And so this is why like for Dendron, our approach is actually instead of like you can show search in Dendron and search will always have a place, but the primary way that you access notes in Dendron is by um, finding it via the hierarchy that you've organized it in. And we help you refactor, change, and enforce those hierarchies. And so when you do a we call it a lookup in Dendron, when you do a lookup in Dendron, instead of doing a table scan of everything that you have ever like written, you're doing um, a reference on a field that you've indexed. So it's taking an O of N operation and changing it to an O of 1 operation. But most imp importantly, that O of 1 is human time instead of machine time. So as a human, um, you can you know, only scan through so much at a time. And so that that's why it, that's important. Uh, uh I have about three different directions I want to go, but something that came to mind real quick. Uh, I don't remember where I read this to give credit, but somebody was 
talking about how when you're talking about organization, there are two different ways to do it. You can either categorize or you can tag. And he was making the statement that for many, many cases, tagging is going to be the way to go. And so just just to 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 kind of put meat on this, you know, um, you can organize things in a tree where everything has one category and that category is under one other category. Or you can say this little bit of information can be tagged with work. It can be tagged with, you know, a person's name. It can be tagged with, you know, a business name, what have you. Um, what what does Dendron use? You know, if we were to say here here are our two different uh, our two different approaches to this organization, uh, is it a tree or is it tags or can you use both? Yeah, uh, short answer: you can use both, but we're very opinionated on what you should do um, <laughs> okay. in terms of tags. And I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, so tags <laughs> are very flexible, and that is both good and bad. They're good in the sense that you can you know, put a node in multiple places because it has many different contexts. And in computer terms, that's great because like there's nothing wrong with that. But as a human, um, tags break down. And I'm talking as somebody who on Evernote, I have over 150 tags before I decided to give up on that system. Um, is that when you have multiple ways of tagging an object or tagging a note, then this um, is problematic both when you add information and when you try to find information. Because when you add, you don't know if you've tagged this mm -hmm. note and everywhere it should be tagged in. And when you're trying to look for a note and you're looking at by tag and you don't find it, you don't know if it's because that note doesn't exist or you simply didn't use the right tag. Tags, because they're so flexible, they also put a lot of tax on you as a human when you are working with notes. And it's kind of like, I compare it to like the go-to statement. The go-to statement is incredibly powerful, but it's not meant for humans because it's too flexible <laughs> and it's hard to reason about that. And so the way that we recommend people do it in Dendron is put it in a hierarchy um, and then you can add a tag to it if you need to associate it with multiple places. But whatever your primary context for that note is, um, put it in that particular hierarchy so that you have a way of referencing it. Um, and then use tags as like a secondary measure if you want to also add a backlink to it in other places. Kevin, I want to change gears for just a second because one of the main reasons is this sounds like something that could be uh, very useful for a lot of people, myself included. Uh, as I think about the kind of data that we might want to put into this, though, I I'm... Uh, I immediately have to worry about privacy and security. I mean, you know, if I were to... Say, if I were to take my business things and go to put them in a dendron tree um there's going to be passwords that need to be stored in there um proprietary information potentially uh does dendron have kind of a security layer can it do um encryption of everything and decryption on the fly uh is that kind of stuff in scope yeah uh good question so short answer and long answer the short answer is right now um we have Dendron is primarily used actually by privacy focused individuals. And uh, where we're good at right now is one, um, everything is local. Um, so you have full control of your data. Like we don't actually see any of it. And nothing leaves your computer unless, of course, you decide to sync it yourself. Um, or users manage syncing today using Git or Dropbox or anything that can sync notes between one computer or another. So, you know, the best privacy is simply not sharing it um, with whoever uh, is behind the, the tool that you're using. Um, and the other thing that we do that is, um, is because, for example, we let you manage your workspaces as a bunch of different Git repositories, um, people actually use this for both work and personal. And it divides pretty nicely because what you could do is you can say, hey, I have my personal vault and that stuff that, you know, for I'm comfortable putting in Dropbox, and I'm going to leave it in Dropbox. But for my work information, um, which can't leave my work computer, I'm going to have it local to my work computer. So you can create a dungeon workspace that has both, uh, basically has a configuration to know that these two vaults exist, and it'll work seamlessly when you're at work and when you're at home. Um, so um, to answer your question about privacy and security, like today, 
the way that we handle that is by leaving it up to you and on your computer. So you can decide um, for whatever substrate that you use to, not substrate, but like medium or application that you use to sync your data or store your data, um, that is a decision that we leave up to you. Um, in the future, uh, like long term, we are also going to look at uh, one of the things we're looking into is doing encrypted end-to-end -end sync of your notes as an addition that we can offer for users that want a managed way, for example, of syncing their notes in multiple places. And then I'm I'm curious what so obviously it's built built on top of VS Code and it's got uses Git for the back end, um, but the actual the code of the project what what programming language did you guys decide to go with? Yeah, the programming language for basically all of Tendron is TypeScript, Node.js, uh, Node.js, TypeScript, and um, we manage it all using Lerna, which is uh, used for monorepos and primary JavaScript applications. Um, so everything is, yeah, JavaScript all the way down. I'm curious about one last thing. Um, are, are there any sort of outlier interesting uses that, that you've discovered that were unexpected? People using it in, in ways that you didn't expect them to and doing sort of new and different things that may actually broaden your, your feature set down the road? Yeah, um, there were a lot. Um, like I like I started Engine because I needed a way of managing different programming languages. Like um, because if you use more than one dynamic language, like what is true, what is false, that is different in every language. Um, so my primary use case was like tracking programming languages or tracking AWS services. Um, but when Engine was released, um, I think one of her first big use cases that people came up with were for world building and storytelling. And so we had a lot of D and D users. Who are using Dendron to uh, Dendron to plan games, and you know, like having like characters and places and locations, and they just had different hierarchies for like different places and different like scenes that they wanted to explore, um, which was really cool to see. Um, the other one was, for example, the professional gamer that wanted to track Street Fighter characters. That's something that you know, like, was so far removed from things I was thinking about, but it was really cool to see that be a use case. Um, and a lot of writers, just like people who are, yeah, working on books, working on stories, so they're using Dendron to track their world and the characters within it. That's cool. Have any of their feature requests made it back in? Um, what do you mean by feature requests? Feature requests, maybe for for a use that you weren't expecting, just something. Has any of that, um, those have any of those new and interesting uses uh, come back into the software? In any way, in any Got tangible it. way. Um, so I guess I wasn't sure if I, maybe I misunderstood your question. So those are use cases people are doing with Dendron today. But are you asking about like what yes. feature requests people would like to see extended in Dendron? Well, yeah, I just wondered if if a, if something, if some, a user were using it in a way that you didn't expect, perhaps they would come back with you saying, well, I've been using it to you know, catalog my collection of teapots or, or something and, and there's this one feature that I'd really like to see and I wondered if that had if that had happened yet and, and had and you had benefited from those um, unexpected uses. Hey, hey Kevin, Adam. I, I use yeah. I use Dendron to manage my D and D characters. Can you add a dice roller please? Yeah. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Got it, got it. Yeah, that has not happened in terms of D&D. Um, where I have had requests is actually a lot in the corporate space. Um, because people are using Dendron for work, because they can keep, because a, a lot of companies have, corporate, uh, have uh, policies where you can't store sensitive information on a tool that syncs to the cloud, um, they're able to use Dendron because it's local to their work computer. So if I've had requests, for example, like, can I use, can I take my notes and publish it into, for example, Azure Wiki, um, so that I can share it with the rest of my team? Or can I, um, yeah, or like, can I publish Dendron privately uh, from behind a firewall? And so those are, um, and in terms of like features, that's where, it's not that we added features, but we've added documentation on how to do that. Because um, since Dendron compiles into static assets, like you can host it anywhere. But we have ended up like writing additional guides of, hey, here's how you deploy Dendron um, 
like behind an HTTP auth on your own server. And so a lot of, I think, these use cases has just resulted in additional documentation for those use cases. All right, Kevin, I'm, I'm curious. I know we've we covered this just a little bit. You, you do Dendron full time as your day job. What, what does the funding model for that look like? How, how does that actually pay your bills? Yeah, so the funding model is interesting. Um, before working on Dendron, I was at Amazon for five years. So for the initial time, the funding model was kind of like Jeff's model with Blue Origin. I just sold Amazon stock and um, <laughs> that was funding Dendron. Um, now what we have is I've set up some contribution tiers. So you can think of it as a Patreon-like model. So people who support financially to Dendron, um, they call it environmentalists. Um, and we're going with Dungeon as a, the tree analogy, and that's why a lot of our roles are tree themed. Um, but as an environmentalist, there are different tiers, and essentially at the different tiers, what you get is, well, you get a sticker, you get a handwritten note, um, you get access to insider releases, and you know various other things. But really what it comes down to is it's, it's like a support Kevin plan, like people are buying into the support Kevin plan. Um, and that's currently, right now, in terms of income, where Dendron uh, is getting it from. But we right now, we're also looking into managed offerings. So I kind of touched upon this a little earlier, but like managed end-to-end um, sync, or for example, managed publishing, where instead of going to Netflix or some other service, like actually Dendron can do that for you. Um, if you go to Dendron, we actually have a business, sec- uh, business section about how will Dendron uh, make money and um, in there, essentially, it's like from day one, I've kind of laid out that I want Dungeon to be a full time thing, but I also don't want to be a major, uh, what do you call it? It shouldn't be sacrificial. Like people should be able to work on this full time without having to feel like they're doing volunteer work. And so the idea kind of is like Dungeon the client, it's open source, it's free, like it will always be free and you will always be able to use it. But like for managed offerings, so things that we have to pay for, like synch- um, like manage sync, manage hosting, and any additional feature add on top of that, like those are areas we'll look to do premium, like subscription based businesses off of. All right, we are boy that that conversation has gone by just just. Uh, very, very quickly, we're running out of time getting towards the end of our show, and so we've got some questions that we always want to cover, and the first of it, the first one is kind of a difficult question. You've got to do some set math on this. You have to think about all the things that we asked you about, and then think about all the things that you wanted to talk about, and kind of figure out where they overlap. Is there anything we didn't ask you about that you you just want to let people know about? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's so many things, but I think at the <laughs> At the end of the day, I would say that, you know, if you are a note taker or even if you're not, um, like managing, like trying to manage the overwhelming amount of information we have today, like it's, it's a problem. And, you know, Dendron, like this is, Dendron is my attempt to solve that problem. Um, today, you know, if you've given up on note taking or you're an intense note taker, like I would just say like, give it a try and see and like open up your mind to the idea of like oh like organizing your notes and just seeing how that goes all right and then um our dot calls it all our control question um do you intend to bring blockchain to dendron yeah <laughs> uh you know this has been suggested um people have brought this up <laughs> And mm. while I don't have any immediate plans to do this, um, it is interesting in the sense that if you think about, for example, I was talking about hosting Dendron. Um, I guess something that would be more in spirit of like something that is open is also like having decentralized hosting. Um, it is something that if you are interested in working on it, by all means, I will help you get started and show you where it is like the relevant parts of the code. But it is something that I currently neither have the bandwidth or the expertise to really think much about. Uh, I like it. Um, Kevin, our, our final two questions. What is your favorite scripting language and text editor? And we may be able to guess, but uh, go ahead and let us know. <laughs> Um, scripting language. So I started off on Python, and so I 
I really like Python. I'm actually sad that the world has turned to JavaScript. And Dungeon is all in JavaScript more <laughs> because of necessity than TypeScript's taken it very far. So it's actually a pretty nice language. But Python is my favorite scripting language. Um, and while I was handling, I forgot your second question. What is your favorite oh, text editor? editor? Yeah, so it's been Vim for, you know, I would say like the majority of my programming career. But I would say like as of the last year or two, it's actually been VS Code and VS Codium. Um, just because I think with Vim, like I always have to bring along all my plugins and everything before it feels just right. Whereas like VS Codium, it feels light enough, even though it's an Electron app, that it has just, a nice, just enough presets to make it feel comfortable without overbearing, without it being overbearing. All right, perfect. Kevin, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I feel like we could, and we, we say this sometimes, but it is absolutely true. I feel like we could talk for another hour and not run out of questions or things to talk about. Um, but we do limit the show to an hour, so we're going to let you go for now. But we, we've already started plotting uh, about uh, giving you a few months and then having you back and uh, getting an update on the project. But uh, Kevin Lynn, thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks for having me on. All right. Catherine, what do you think? Quite an interesting project, isn't it? Yeah, it is very interesting. I, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, I, I looked into it a little bit last night, and it's intriguing. I, I, am, I will admit um, the learning curve did inten- intimidate me a little bit. It's, it's one of those cases where with great power and flexibility comes, um, <laughs> well, complexity. And, but I'm, you know, <laughs> what, I, what I maybe should have asked is, so, how, how will Dendron make me smarter and more organized? Because that's, that's what I'd like to investigate further, for sure. Yes. I almost, almost feel like I need to watch a video of somebody sitting down at Dendron, for, somebody that knows what they're doing with it, sitting down mm-hmm. at Dendron, starting with a blank slate and just beginning to put you know, information in in an organized mm-hmm. way. And I, I feel like it would make more sense if I could see, see someone use it, and uh, then maybe I would have a, a better mental model about how it's supposed to work. Yeah, there are a couple videos. I think you know, check them out for sure. It was, it's worth looking more. It's worth looking into a little bit more. Yes, if I can, if I can convince myself to download a uh, Microsoft project and run it on my computer, <laughs> I will. Ah, uh, yes, this a hurdle shot. number one. Hurdle number. Yeah, it really one. is. Some of those, uh, some of those old instincts die hard. I, I can tell you this: if I do grab it, I will definitely be using VS Codium and not VS Code. <laughs> fair, totally fair. Uh, all right. Well, we uh, we have a great show coming up next week as well. Uh, Doc should be back for next week. Uh, he should be all vaccinated up. And uh, next week we're going to talk to Charles Hoskinson, the f- godfather of blockchain, question mark. I, I'm not familiar with Hoskinson, but uh, it should be a really interesting show. <laughs> we should, <laughs> the entire show, the whole show is going to be our control question. What do you think about blockchain? That's going to be it. That's going to be the whole show is going to be the joke question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too funny. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah. Well, Make sure to catch us next week. It'll be it'll be Doc and one of the lovely and talented co-hosts. Um, but until then, this is Floss Weekly. Um, oh, oh, Catherine, I'm so sorry. Do you have anything that you wanted to plug before we go? Oh, uh, you know, sure. I so I actually, you know, I Doc has mentioned that Doc and I actually do another podcast, uh, slightly different topics, not necessarily specifically uh, open source software. But we do that every week. It's called Reality Two Cast. You can find that at Reality Two, the number two, Reality Two Cast dot com. Um, and I'm kind of excited about the project that I'm working on in my actual real day job is launching soon, and that's called Aquia CMS, which is an opinionated Drupal. I highly recommend uh, <laughs> checking that out so that you know I can continue to get paid for work every day. <laughs> All right, it's excellent. actually a really cool project too. So. If you've ever thought yeah. Drupal was just too darn hard, it's it's worth checking out. It is, um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll we'll make sure to do that. Um, I will I will quickly plug uh, that you can catch me over on Hackaday.com. Uh, I do a security column there, kind of a wrap up of what's going on throughout the week, and that goes live generally every Friday morning, assuming that I get everything turned in on time and the editors aren't on vacation. Um, Hackaday.com, great great website for really for uh, people doing 
mainly hardware, but in the the hacker slash open source ethos. And uh, so make sure and check that out, particularly Friday mornings, the This Week in Security column. Um, I think that's all I've got. Thank you, everyone, live and listening recorded. Uh, We're so glad you came along with us this week, and we will see you next time on Floss Weekly. Hey, folks, I'm Ant Pruitt, host of Hands of Photography here on Twit TV. I know some of you have gotten yourself a brand new camera or you just had a camera sitting around and can't quite figure out how to get the most out of it. Well, I have a solution. My show, Hands on Photography. So subscribe right now to learn how to get the most out of that camera. I'm going to show you how to make those images pop. I don't care if it's a Canon camera. I don't care if it's a Sony, Nikon, iPhone, Android, even an inexpensive Android device. I got you covered. So head on over to twit.tv slash hop and subscribe today.